We're back in our study of First John in chapter 3. Be turning your Bibles there. If you remember last time we met, which has been a couple of weeks uh, now, last time we talked about uh, the title of the message was Do Not Be Deceived, and we're talking about the deception that we have, uh, are we, the way we can deceive ourselves into believing that we're something that we're not. And so the, the greatest proof of that, uh, if we are to say that we are believers and we, we love Jesus and, and all those things, is love. And it's abiding in love. That's, that's going to be the, the most evident uh, truth that we can find uh, in our own lives. Back in the 80s, if you're familiar with uh, the, the pop singer or soul singer maybe, I'm not sure how you would classify her, Tina Turner. If you're familiar with her, she had a song uh, that was called What's Love Got to Do With It? Anybody familiar with that? Yeah, a couple of people. They'll raise their hand and say, yeah. Well, in the lyrics of her song, uh, she, she called love, a second-hand emotion, a second-hand emotion, and so I was like, I'm thinking about that. Maybe in a sense, what she was saying that was that 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 love is maybe overrated, right? Maybe it's overrated, or or maybe it's just a, just another emotion, uh, you know, more, nothing more than like a feeling you get, like being hungry or being sad. Is that is that the case? Is that how you would describe what love is? Is that true? No. No, surely not. And, and John would argue for the same thing. It's not a secondhand emotion. As a matter of fact, it's the center of who we are as believers. Right? When you think of you know, God, and God is love. Right? It's important to who we are. And through Christ's saving grace, love becomes who we are. You have to say that love is a state of, be- of being more than it is an emotion. And we love because our Father loves us. We're infused with love. Right? Love becomes who we are. And so let's look at our passage tonight. And start in verse 11. The message of love. The message of love. Verse 11 and 12. It says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. So this message of love, it's nothing new. It's nothing new coming on the scene. It's not some, some new fangled thing that people come up with. It's always been that way. It's the gospel. It's the gospel message, and it's always been from the beginning. It's nothing uh, new about it. And we talked extensively about it last Sunday morning. We spent time the whole morning talking about John 3.16 and breaking it apart. And if you weren't here and weren't able to, to, to hear that, then I'd encourage you to, to find our, our uh, page on, on YouTube and, and give that a listen. It's no reason for me to rehash it completely again this morning. But that's the message. That's the gospel. John three sixteen and 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's the message that John's referring to here. The charge for us is to love one another. When it says one another here in this case, in the context, other believers. This is almost like a carryover from this morning's sermon. As I, I've been preparing both sermons, I was like, I got confused at times. Like, which one am I working on? Because they overlap. That's a good thing. When you're, you have a common thing, when you're talking about love, it, it should be part of everything that we're dealing with. And all these sermons in God's word. Uh, deal with the same things. Uh, uh, Daniel, Daniel Aiken uh, says it like this in regards to loving one another. It says, John, following Jesus, says, we are to love consistently and comprehensively, continually and individually, play no favorites, show no biases, practice no discriminations among your brothers and sisters. After all, we are family. Love for others flows out of God's love for us. It is at the heart of the gospel. Love has everything to do with it. And it's not merely a suggestion, as I've already said. It's commanded of us by Jesus himself. There's lots of verses that bear this out. And I'll just give you a few. John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And in John 15, 12, and 17, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And in verse 17, these things I command you, 
that you love one another. Right? Is that clear? That's just a few. You want more? I got more. This is from, Paul, from, from Paul's writings. Romans 12, 10. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Galatians 5, 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. All right? So that's Paul. So we got Jesus. We got Paul. And last but not least, good old Peter. Peter chimes in in his letters as well. 1 Peter 1, 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. And lastly, 1 Peter 4, 8. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Right? It's everywhere. And this is just a couple. I could have went on and on and on. When, if you have a, a concordance, Look it up. Look up love one another. Look up love. And, and, or if you have a computer, it's even faster. Go to Bible Gateway or another one of those, those sites and enter that in. And you just, the page will fill up with examples of love and loving one another. It, it's pretty important. It's a theme throughout the Bible. So if it's important in the Bible, it should be important to us as well. And then so John also gives us an example of how not to love in this opening verse. He's open, opening two verses of how not to love. And he went all the way back to Genesis 4, to the first murder when Cain killed Abel. Right? God accepted uh, Abel's uh, first fruit offering and rejected Cain's offering. You remember? And Cain became angry. He became angry and killed his brother. And so God takes us loving one another extremely serious. I don't know whether you know that or not. He equates hating with murder. You say, man, that's kind of steep you, to, to, to hate and murder. You're trying to put those two to the same thing. That's not the same, is it? I'm just saying what the Bible teaches, that, that whenever we hate our brothers, it's, it's like killing them. It's like murder is what God's word says. And so we ask the question from our verse, why did Cain murder Abel? Right? Why did he kill him? It says right there in our, in our verse, because he was uh, of the wicked one. Right? When he says that, that, Cain did not love God or righteousness. That's why. That's why, and that, those are the same traits that, that Satan has. And more or less, uh, all unbelievers have those same traits as well. They have no love for God, and, and they do not love righteousness. It also says that Cain uh, murdered Abel because his works were evil. And Cain was evil. And this sounds pretty like a no-brainer. It's not going to be a shock to anyone. Write this down. Evil people do evil things. Right? Right? It's as simple as that. Evil people do evil things. And lastly, why did Cain murder Abel? Because his brother's works were righteous. And that's kind of one that kind of puzzles us, right? We kind of think of it that way. Have you ever, you know, seen somebody do a good deed and, and see how, you know, some people get excited and they appreciate when something is done, done well or, or righteousness is, you know, displayed. And then some people get angry. You ever seen that? When, like, when a good deed, I mean, where does that come from? Is, is it a jealousy? Is it, is it some type of a, of a deep hatred in, inside of you that wells up? And whenever you, when somebody does something that wells up, is it, is it jealousy? Or is it some hidden bitterness? Or I'm not sure what it is, but that's what happens here. And maybe when uh, Cain saw what, how God responded to his offering, that, that, that anger, that bitterness just well up inside of him, Abel's offering was accepted and his was rejected. So pay attention to the people around you when you're out and about. Just pay attention to uh, how they respond when, when, when good things happen. You know, when you're in a crowd of people and you see things happen. And what I've noticed is sometimes whenever, you know, a, a good deed is done or some good works are performed, it's sometimes like in, you know, in, in some scary movies or, or where like, a, a, like the Exodus movies where they take holy water and throw it on somebody who's possessed. And they, and they, they, you know, they recall and they hiss and like steam comes off of them. That's what people look like sometimes, right? They respond that way. They, they're, they're angry about it and it bothers them. And so love and, and genuine goodness tends to sting them. And maybe that's that resentment again that, that's coming out, that bitterness. And a lot of times they can't just accept what's being done out of love. They can't, they just reject that. They're just, that's a foreign concept that, 
that you would you would take your time or your talents or your your monies or whatever it is and and, and serve me and do this right i've seen it you know they're, they're, they're thinking you're trying to work an angle they're thinking you have an ulterior motive that they're wait they're waiting for the end right they're waiting for the punch line so you know okay you've now you've served me and, and you've blessed me now where's the where's the Where's the kicker here? Where's the, the thing? What, what do I have to do to reciprocate this? And there's nothing. There is no reciprocation. That, that uh, you know, uh, out of love, out of generosity, out of the overflow of what Christ has done for me, I want to serve you in this way. I see it when I share with people what the Bible teaches. And maybe you've done that as well with coworkers or even family members. When you just say these, these, these three words, God's word says, and then watch the reaction. Hmm? Watch the reaction. Watch how people respond whenever you do that. Use those three words God's word says and watch what happens. That even happens with Christians sometimes. With Christians, right? Or so called Christians, right? The ones that don't know their Bible very well, right? As believers, we love all people, but especially other believers. That's why he's so heavy on this, this word, this phrase, to one another. Which leads nicely to our next point. The reaction to love. The reaction to love. Verses 13 to 15. says, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him pretty tough passage isn't it pretty harsh but it's clear and we should know it the world hates you right going back to the world the world system it's not set up for believers the enemy satan right now is in charge and the world hates you and if we're living out our faith properly unbelievers are convicted by the way we live our lives it makes them ashamed and you know unless you've been a believer since you were a child if you can think back, if you're, you're, you came to Christ as an adult or as a teenager, uh, you knew how it felt to be around believers. You were, you were convicted by, by, the, by the way they lived their lives. You lived your life. You felt ashamed. You knew something deep down inside of you knew that something was wrong. And when you was around somebody that, that didn't cuss, you know, when you, when you was around somebody that, that didn't drink, when you was around somebody that, that you know, loved their, their, you know, honored and obeyed their parents, it brought conviction to you, didn't it? And so it's the same way here that, that it stirs up this, this hatred because the natural man only loves those that loves them back, right? That's going to get something out of it. The natural man only serves those who will serve them back, and the natural man only forgives those that will forgive them in return, right? Tit for tat is the, is the, is the saying. That's how the natural man works. So the world hates us, and then John says that we know that we're saved if we have an abiding love for one another. We know. You know, you say, well, how can we know if we're saved? How can we know if we have eternal life? That's one of the proofs, one of the evidences that we love one another, have an abiding love for one another. And abiding is the key, for, uh, key phrase once again for us. And if we remember, what does it mean to abide? It means to remain or to continue. Right? To remain or to continue. So I know some of y'all are probably thinking right now, having some questions and in your head, and, and, and one might be is, are the people of God capable of hating one another at times? Good question, right? Honest question. And what would you say? Maybe, yes, no? Yes. The answer is absolutely yes. Sure. But the difference between a believer and an unbeliever is that a believer will become convicted about this, and then we'll confess it, we'll ask for forgiveness, and then we'll reconcile that's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. Now, if not, if there is no conviction and there is no desire to reconcile, you have reason to be concerned. Right? You have reason to be concerned because the believers don't do that. And also another question, talking about this idea of, of hatred and murder, are the people of God capable of actually murdering someone? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, absolutely. The, the one that came to my mind right away is David. Right? David, when he had Uriah killed to cover up his, uh, uh, his affair 
with Bathsheba. But you remember what happened? The prophet Nathan came to him. Remember the little story he told about the little lamb? And he finished it off with, you are the man. Not, not, not meaning that in a good way, but you're the one. You're the one who did this evil thing. And then David was overcome with remorse and grief after he was confronted. And so David's life was not marked as a murderer, was it? He wasn't known as a murderer. That's when everybody brings up David. They don't think of David as a murderer, do they? We think of David as a man after God's own heart, right? Right? So, I want you to think about it like this way. If, if, all right, contingent upon, if, if you abide in hatred for other believers, you need to be very concerned. You need to be very concerned because John says no murderer has eternal life. And we're staying with the theme, hatred and murder, hatred and murder. If you hate your brother, you're the same as a murderer. And John says that no murderer has eternal life when he wrote the book of Revelation. Revelation 21, 7 to 9. It says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. Just one note about this list. All of these things are ongoing. Our word for tonight, abiding actions. All right? Has anybody in here ever lied? Yeah? Lied? Yeah. All right? It's, well, that's on the list. If you, just, if you take this as being a one-time thing, then guess what? You're in trouble. All, right? All these things, you know, sexually immoral. Anybody ever been a sexually immoral? Had lustful thoughts? Anybody? Be in trouble, right? So this can't be what that means. This is re- referring to an ongoing thing, abiding actions, not just one-time events. And that, if that were the case, we'd all have reason to be afraid. So maybe this is what's the, 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 the puzzling thing or maybe the outcry uh, in our day and age. You know, maybe it's just the political air that we breathe and the way things get worked up. It, but don't it seem like sometimes we, we pick certain sins to demonize more than others? Don't we? Don't we do that? And I saw, I saw a neat little thing on, on, uh, on Facebook, uh, the little, I don't know what they're called, the little pictures with words in it. I don't know what, they have, a, they have a term for it. I can't remember it. But it said, don't judge me because I sin differently than you do. And that's so true, isn't it? That, that, that we would point out somebody else's sin because it's different than our sin. We're, we're sitting there pointing at each other. And, and, and now, to, today, it's popular, I guess, because of the, the movement for the same-sex marriage and, and whatnot, that that one right there is the one that's out in front, and that's the one that's kind of being shoved in our face. The outcry against homosexuality. You know, and, and what's funny is that there are many that believe you can be a practicing homosexual and also be a born-again believer. That one puzzles me. It puzzles me. And, and, and we watch uh, a Survivor. We watch it like every season it comes on, the, on on CBS, and we enjoy watching that. And this last season, they had uh, two men uh, that were like Broadway performers and openly gay. And, and I didn't know during the show, it wasn't until the end that it came out that, uh, that they said they were Christians, born again believers. And they professed that. And, and at, the, at the closing of the show, uh, they have the uh, award ceremonies, and, and, and you know, a person in the crowd stood up once they said that. And, uh, uh, this one young lady stood and, and she said this. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. She said that she was proud of how they represented true Christians. Oh, it hurt my heart. It hurt my heart to to to, to think that. I mean, uh, the loving attitude of this young lady that's beautiful and great. But to, but to, but to think that to perpetuate that and say that that's okay, that God's okay with that, and that's what true Christianity is about. It hurt my heart to watch that. You see, homosexuality and the same-sex uh, relationships, that's abiding in sin. It's not repenting. It's continuing. It's like saying, it's like saying I know God's word says this, but yet I'm going to keep doing it anyway. That's abiding in sin. That's not repentance. Do you, you see the difference? And we all struggle with that. Like, think about it in your own life. You know, you would, you know, 
it's easy for, for a preacher to get up and preach a sermon about, against things that don't affect him, right? That's why, like in Southern Baptist, we like to preach about, I don't, I stay away from it. But some preachers like to talk about alcohol all the time. The evils of alcohol. You know why they talk about it all the time? Because they don't struggle with it. They don't struggle with it. That's why they don't talk about, about alcohol, right? That same preacher might be 400 pounds. You know why he never preached, preaches against gluttony and being overweight and being obese? Because that does affect them, right? You'll never see a big 400-pound preacher ranting and raving about obesity or gluttony, but he will preach against homosexuality. He will preach against things that doesn't affect him, against alcohol, and that's a problem. So think of it this way, maybe. I'm not, I'm not you know, attacking homosexuality. I'm not being pro this or pro that. I just want to start thinking about sin in a broader sense, that the, the problem is not the sin itself. It's abiding in the sin. That's the problem. That's the real problem. So to be fair, the emphasis on homo- is the emphasis on homosexuality or the problem in abiding in homosexuality? It's abiding. Is the emphasis on murder or is the emphasis on abiding in murder? Right? It's about abiding in murder. And also, contrary to these things, is the emphasis on loving one another or abiding in love for one another? See the difference? Are y'all, are, y'all, are y'all getting this? The difference in it is it's not just loving, it's abiding in love. It's not just sinning, it's abiding in sin. It's where you remain, it's what you're known as. And the red flag for us would be abiding in sin. Any sin. Any sin. Know this, abiding in sin proves that we do not have eternal life abiding in us. That's what the verse says. That's what the Word of God says. Abiding in sin proves we do not have eternal life abiding in us. And that's a scary thought. But it also says abiding in love for one another proves that we have eternal life abiding in us. Abiding in love for one another proves we have eternal life abiding in us. And then lastly... Verses 16 to 18, the overflow from love. By this we know love, because he had laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. To sum it up, love does something. Love does something, right? More than just words. You know, God did not just say he loved the world. He gave his only begotten son to demonstrate his love, right? Words are nice, but actions are better. Like the saying goes, talk is cheap, right? Anybody can, anybody can you know, use words and, and say things. It takes a lot more to, to actually do things. In this part of our, our passage, it says that talks about laying down our lives that's a scary thought when we think about that we ever thought about that laying down your lives and and so it makes us question to ourselves a question you may have in your head does that mean we all become martyrs for the sake of christ and the short answer is no for the majority of us you know i, I, w- I would think that that right now that's not really in america that's not really a, a real threat that we have at this point And most of us will never be called to physically sacrifice our lives for others. But something about that that, that martyr, something about those those heroes uh, in our lives, maybe that's why we have this 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 thing in us, this attraction to those stories where that involve heroes, that somebody gives up themselves, where in a war movie where uh, the the guy dies on the grenade to save the rest of his of his troops. Right? Somebody sacrifices for the greater good. We're drawn to these things. Maybe that's why we have such a, an appeal or such an admiration for soldiers and policemen and firemen and paramedics and organ donors, right? Because they're willing to make that sacrifice. But we are called that we, we are to love through our actions, though. We love through our actions. And John saw firsthand uh, what loving one another looked like when the church first began in its infancy, all the way back in Acts chapter 4. When everybody was sharing, 
Acts 4, 32 to 35 says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. Doesn't that sound nice? And I know, I know some of us will read that, that verse and we start thinking, that sounds like communism. So, it, so that, that, that sounds like, you know, that just breeds laziness and that breeds generosity. If, if that's what comes to your mind when you're thinking of, well, I worked hard for this and why should I have to give my stuff to somebody who don't work as hard as I do? That's the enemy. That's the enemy. That's evil is what that is not talking about enabling lazy people that's not what this verse is about this is about helping somebody in need right this isn't about holding somebody up this is about lifting somebody up that's why our welfare system fails right it's broken because it's become a tool because people aren't, aren't just lifted up they're held up by it that's not what this is this this is meeting needs of people who have real needs and truth be told our brothers and sisters in christ don't need us to die for them right they don't they need us to help with the necessities of life, food, clothing, and shelter. That's what they need. We should have this attitude. We should say this in our, in our, in our hearts, in our heads. You need it. I have it. Come get it. And that might be some of you guys. I know it is. Right? Very generous people in this church. I know it. They'd say that whatever you need, I got it. Come get it. And here's the thing about it. It's not because you have multiples of one thing. Because some people are like that. Well, I have five coats. It won't hurt me to give away, you know, one. I know people in this church that only have one coat and they'd give it to you. Right? And that's the right thing to do. And that's what we're talking about here. That's what this verse is talking about. And the shame of it is to know a fellow Christian is in need and do nothing. Because that's not consistent with who we are as, as believers. That's not what Christ would do. Just imagine if God did that, had that same attitude towards us in our sin. Think about this. If he'd say this, Oh no, my image bearers have sinned. They'll spend eternity in hell for it. What a terrible condition to be in. I could do something about it, but I'm kind of busy being God. Because hmm? that's really what it comes down to, isn't it? For us, when we know there's a need to be met, it's, it's an inconvenience. It's an inconvenience that maybe we'll have to stop doing something that we want to be doing or, or maybe we won't, we won't have as much uh, overflow as we would like. You know, I'm trying to save for whatever and if I help out with this or I give this much to this offering then I won't have as much. I want my pile to get smaller. I like to have a big pile, right? Because what if something happens? I need my pile in case something happens. There's nothing wrong with preparing for the future. There's nothing, nothing wrong with, with planning for retirement. But when it handcuffs you from being generous to other people, and especially to the household of God, that's sin. That's wrong. That's demonic. John Phillips said this better than I could say it, so I'll just quote what he said. We may not be called upon to give our lives in sacrifice, but we are certainly called upon to give ourselves, our lives in service. All right? That's truth. That's the truth. So in closing tonight, just a few questions, a little diagnostic for you to think about as we close. So how is your love life, spiritually speaking? Hmm? Are you abiding in love? Is there, is there some holes there that need to be addressed? some resentment, some bitterness? Do you love your faith family in tangible ways? Right? In tangible ways, not just words, because we'll say that, and that's right. I, I hope that everywhere you go, you talk about how much you love the people of Occupy too. I do. But it goes beyond that. Are you loving in tangible ways? Because love costs. It can cost you time. It may cost you materially. Right? Are you doing that? 
do you have any hatred or indifference in your heart to repent of? It's murder. We don't want to be abiding in hatred. If there's anything that we need to repent of, tonight would be a good time to take care of that. And if it's a, a bitterness or a hatred with somebody in this room, this would be a beautiful time to do that as we get ready to close. Or when we leave this place, if you need to make a phone call or make a personal visit, do that. But see, because the, the sin that you're holding back and, 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 and being ate up with, it's not just affecting you. It's affecting all of us. Right? Like that, that rotten apple in a barrel, the same effect. You know, our sin, when, when people say things like, well, it's none of your business, you know, if this is my sin and, I, and I'm dealing with it. This, this doesn't affect you. It's, you're wrong. We're in this together. Your sin affects me. My sin affects you. And we need to remember that. There's no such thing as private sin. Right? We're in this together. And then lastly, just have you to think about one thing. Is your life characterized by abiding in love or abiding in sin? Because the difference is eternal life. Or eternal death. That's what it boils down to. Let's be people that are abiding in love. Let's pray and we'll have a moment of response. Father, thank you for the clarity of your word tonight. We thank you for uh, scripture that is clear. We're thankful for uh, John and his writings where uh, he leaves uh, no room for doubt. We thank you for his uh, clarity and, and just the bluntness of the way he communicates. Father, the way you place that in his heart to, to, to write this. So, Father, I pray that we at each one examine ourselves. Father, that what exactly characterizes our lives? What are we known for abiding in? Are we known for abiding in love for one another? Or are we known for abiding in sin? If someone were to be asked on the street about us as individuals, what would it be said about us? How are we known? What is our witness in this community? Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being generous towards us. Father, help us to love one another, not just in words, but in deeds as well. Thank you again for this time that we've been given this day. Father, I pray that it's been honoring to you. And Father, I pray that as we leave this place tonight, that we leave here changed. Father, that we live this week to your glory in everything that we say and do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.